Welcome to this episode of the Structural Engineering Channel, a podcast focused on helping structural engineering professionals stay up to date on technical trends in the field and to help them to succeed in their careers and lives. I'm your host, Matt Picardle, and in this episode, I'm talking to Alistair Sohn, Principal Consultant at Collaborative Reporting for Safer Structures, or CROSS. We interviewed Alistair way back on episode eight, where he talked about Cross UK and Cross International and how the program is providing immense value to structural engineers all over the world. And in this episode, we invited him back to talk about some of the latest developments of Cross, including its expansion into fire safety. This episode of the Structural Engineering Channel is brought to you by PPI, a leader in engineering exam prep for the PE Structural Exam. PPI provides expert prep courses and study resources designed to help you pass the PE Structural Exam the first time. PPI's PE Structural course is fully updated and taught with October 2021 code references and includes new editions of their PE Structural books. PPI's live online courses include hours of lectures, problem solving demonstrations, exam strategy sessions, office hours, and a passing guarantee. When you take a live online course, PPI guarantees you will pass or you can take the on-demand course for free. PPI has helped engineers achieve their licensing goals since 1975. Check out PPI today at ppi2pass.com to see all of the resources available for PE structural exam prep. Again, that's ppi2pass.com. Alistair, welcome to the show. I know we entered you uh, way back in episode eight, where you talked about Cross UK and Cross International. Uh, thanks so much for for joining us again. My pleasure to be here, and, and congratulations on the progress you've made since then. Thanks so much. And uh, for our listeners that might not have listened to that episode and that maybe aren't aware, can you uh, explain to us a little bit more about yourself and the work that you do? Sure. Uh, I'm a registered structural engineer uh, who spent a career designing and constructing buildings of many types. I've always had an interest in safety, ranging from uh, safety at sports grounds, such as soccer stadia, uh, interest in tall buildings, and uh, large chemical processing plants. So, wide experience. I was a CEO of a firm of consulting engineers in the UK. And after retiring from that in 2005, I was asked to set up a trial for confidential reporting on behalf of two major engineering institutions. And that was the beginning of CROSS. Thanks, Alistair. And can you talk a little, uh, for those, for our viewers, can you talk about what CROSS stands for and uh, what what motivated you to get involved with the CROSS program? Sure. Um, The predecessor of CROSS was, was founded in the UK in 1976, way back then, to highlight structural safety in the wake of several high profile failures. Uh, both of buildings and bridges. Now, one of these was called Ronan Point in London, when a small gas explosion near the top of a 22-story building caused a progressive collapse, and that was the first time the term was used, uh, of the precast walls and floors. Now, CROSS has developed considerably since then, and the name now stands for Collaborative Reporting for Safer Structures. Um, We collect reports from professional engineers about safety concerns or occurrences which they have experienced. We strip out all personal details which might identify a person, including the reporter, or an organization or a project. Then the report is reviewed by our team of volunteer experts who give advice about how others can learn from and benefit from the reported concern or occurrence. Uh, These panel members are volunteers. Uh, We never blame anybody, but we give advice that will help others to avoid the same or similar problems. Um, We then go through a legal process to make sure we don't get into any trouble or the reporter doesn't get into any trouble. And these reports and comments are published on our website and in our newsletters. Awesome. And we'll post that website too. So it's essentially, uh, for the engineers that don't know, it's a reporting system that could that basically would help out the structural engineering industry because you can remain anonymous. Uh, I'm gonna put out an example out there and let me know if it's correct or whatnot. 
for example, maybe there's uh, an error with the software, the structural engineering software, and they want to report it, but they want to remain anonymous. Uh, is that an, a good example? Or are there any other examples that, that you can think of off the top of your head? We've got lots of examples. We've got a big database, um, but the software one is very good and it's very relevant because we do get reports about software. A reporter has got to give them uh, got to give us their name. We don't accept anonymous reporters, but once we know that the reporter is genuine and we've talked to them, then we will strip their name out of the process. So that never gets used. The name of the software product would not get used. So it becomes a generic issue. And we will say, for example, there is a concern about the way in which a certain software designs certain types of structure. And we would just advise people on checking and validation methods. Uh, to avoid that issue. Awesome. And last time we spoke, uh, I know implementation of uh, CROSS in the United States was still in its initial stages. Uh, how has CROSS expanded and how has it developed throughout the US uh, now? Right. Well, I'm glad you asked that because CROSS is firmly established in the United States uh, under the auspices of the American Society of Civil Engineers. They've published uh, three newsletters so far and are coming up for another one later in the summer. Uh, but it's found, as expected, many of the issues are common to both cross in the US and cross the UK and in our other region, which is cross Australasia. So the database concerns reports from all three regions. Um, and a good example of cooperation was an alert which we published on the 28th Dean uh, Florida Bridge Collapse, uh, which I think you've got an illustration of. And that was written by jointly by experts in the US and the UK for the benefit of designers and, and constructors. Um, there's also, by the way, an excellent presentation on the subject on YouTube. Um, so that was a good example of joint collaboration. Another very important aspect of, of, of work in the United States uh, with which we are lightly linked is the uh, the most significant forensic engineering investigation in the world currently is being carried out by NIST on the Champlain Towers collapse at Surfside last year. Now this is being jointly led by two distinguished engineers who happen to be XCOM members of Cross US. Uh, and when their findings and recommendations are published in due course, these will be of great importance to all concerned about building safety. Uh, but just to be clear, Cross have no part in the investigation, but the status of these leaders is a measure of the standing of our, of our colleagues in Cross US. Yeah, I know that's one of the unfortunate things about structural engineering is when you hear about those collapses, but I think that shows the importance of Cross, um, where a lot of lessons can be learned from, from these mistakes and uh, it can be more clearly shared through it. Uh, and you know, I think as structural engineers, we don't want to. Unfortunately, we don't want to see those <laughs> uh, infamy during those collapses. But uh, sharing our knowledge throughout with each other, I think that's one of the ways that we can definitely help prevent some of these major uh, failures or uh, collapses and mistakes. Yeah, it's a, it's a very powerful tool in the armory of, of structural engineers to safeguard the public and also to safeguard themselves. Yes, absolutely. And uh, Cross has also recently expanded into fire safety. Uh, what are some of the benefits of this, and how, how and how and why did uh, Cross kind of go into this uh, fire safety re fire safety aspect? One of the worst fire disasters in recent years was in London, when the Grenfell Tower uh, burned down in 2017 and 72 people perished. Now, there were two inquiries from that. One, a legal inquiry into what went wrong and why it went wrong. And the second being a report into what should be done to prevent such a tragedy happening again. And just a bit of background, this was an older concrete frame building with solid external walls. And the decision had been made by the owners, a local authority, to insulate it and cover the insulation with thin sandwich cladding panels for protection and to enhance the appearance. And it transpired that the insulation was flammable and the cladding was highly flammable. So when a small fire started in the kitchen, it spread very rapidly up the outside and the whole building was completely engulfed. 
And the report which said what should be done in future included a recommendation after we had been interviewed by the team writing the report that cross should be expanded in terms of structural safety and extended into fire safety. So the result was we got increased funding, we got new systems, new staff and a new website. And the fire safety system operates in the same way as structural safety. Um, and we have an expert panel of advice on fire reports that we're now getting. And, and I, can, I can illustrate some fire reports if you'd like. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, some of the fire reports have deal with very complex topics uh, and a lot of work is required to ensure that we give the appropriate answers. But a subject of concern at the moment is fires in lithium ion batteries. Those are the type used in cars and, and other electric vehicles. Um, they're not particularly prone to go on fire, but when such a battery gets damaged by an impact, say, the subsequent fire exhibits jetting behavior. And we have an illustration of that. And that may set fire to its surroundings. They're also extremely difficult to surround, uh, to extinguish, and the fire may flare up again after a considerable period. Now, this is not a major problem at present, but what will it be like when the number of battery powered vehicles increases as a consequence of climate change mitigation measures? We're gonna have very many more of them, so that there will be many more fires. And that's just one example. Um, and we have others uh, to do, for example, with uh, the possibility of fires in very tall cross laminated timber buildings. Um, that, that's the type of building you have in, in the USA, of course. Um, and some of our reporters are concerned that fires in such tall buildings may burn to such a degree that they collapse before the residents can escape. So we published a couple of reports on those. And again, the, the problem is small at the moment, but it may increase as the number of timber buildings increases again, as a use of, uh, of climate change pressure to use more sustainable resources. Yes, and uh, thanks for touching up on that because as, as you're saying, there is a lot of pressure on the industry to, to be more sustainable. And uh, that is a concern for maybe those that aren't too familiar with, with the materials and they're asking if they're if all these wood structures are aren't they because when you think of wood if if you don't know too much about it you'll think fire so that's one of the things especially uh as the, that building material is rising uh one of the things that i think the public is going to be more aware of or might be a concern to and like you're saying same thing with with the r structures how we're responsible for the building safety of the public uh that when I was talking to a fire consultant, a uh, colleague of mine, and he did bring up that that tower where, where yes, the facade did catch on fire and how big of a deal it was and the lessons they learned from it. And those are the type of things that, that saves lives. And even if it's not really structural, I mean, the fire affects our structure and things that we can do to, to uh, help mitigate those, those risks, I think is a very important part of it. Getting, getting a bit technical, we're now starting to think of fire in a building as a load on the building structure, not just as a separate event. It, is, it can be part of the same event. Um, now, as yet, there's no fire section within Cross US, but there is an interest from fire engineers in your country, uh, and we hope that some progress will be made in that direction in the not too distant future. And speaking about the future, what does the future hold for cross and building safety? In the UK, as a consequence of Grenfell, there is going to be a new regulatory regime for buildings. And it's going to start with residential buildings uh, taller than 18 meters. Um, and there's going to be a systematic regulatory approach to prevent serious fires and structure. Um, and one of the biggest problems that we've got are there many thousands of existing buildings which will have to be inspected over a period of years and assessed. So CROSS is helping uh, with others to advise on what safety case regime should be for assessing many existing buildings. So that's part of the, our future is, is, is looking into the past, um, being involved in safety cases. Um, and this will extend again in the UK by law, the new building safety regulator has got to have a mandatory 
reporting system for certain classifications of defects and a voluntary reporting system for the rest. And we are working with a regulator on, on both of those systems. Um, so those, those are the main points about our, our future, getting involved in things which are going wrong, identifying big issues and giving advice to help resolve them. Um, and a, a further example, if I might give to you, is uh, a product called Reinforced Autoclaved Aerated Concrete, RAAC for short. And this is a form of lightweight concrete, which was commonly used on the roofs of buildings, such as hospitals and schools uh, in the UK and other parts of Europe in the 60s to 80s. So these buildings are 40 to 60 years old now. And we have an image of a hospital uh, with part of the roof from inside being propped up. Now, uh, in 2018 at Cross, we had a report of a sudden failure of a roof plank in a school. So we published an alert and as a consequence, more reports were received. A forum was established within the, the uh, Institution of Structural Engineers for interested parties to share their knowledge. A cross government body was set up to coordinate matters between government departments. And it has now been discovered that there is a very major issue here. Many hundreds of buildings will require remediation and replacement and the cost over the years will be very many millions of dollars. So going back to the, the picture of the hospital, who wants to lie on a hospital bed or even worse, be in an operating theater surrounded by props? Yeah. So that's a good example of something which started off from a single report to Cross, which has identified a major issue, which is involving large organizations, vast sums of money um, in order to safeguard the public. And for our viewers uh, that are practicing structural engineers, uh, how can they implement CROSS or get involved with CROSS and how can CROSS help them to prevent structural failures? Hey, you can get involved in CROSS. Um, I think you've got details there of how to do it. Uh, it is logging onto a website or, or scanning a code. And a very important point about CROSS is everything is free. No, no cost for everybody. It is paid for uh, by the professional institutions uh, and a certain amount of, of grant money. Um, so when you log on, all we require is your name, your email address, and whether you're interested in Cross US, Cross UK, or Cross Australasia. I recommend getting involved in all three because that means you will get emails whenever a newsletter or alert is published in any of the re regions. So you will keep up to date. So how can we prevent structural failures? We're just going to continue doing what we do best, and that's providing evidence-based advice backed by expert commentary to improve the culture of safety. Um, we've had lots of positive feedback on this, and the, the, the lessons that are being learned within the industry are, are both appreciated um, and, and wanted. Uh, Alistair, uh could you also talk about Piper's Row? I know that was one of the the, the studies that, that Cross did. Uh, Piper's Row is the name of a car park in England. Um, and the roof deck of this failed suddenly one night. Fortunately, there was nobody underneath. Um, it was a flat slab construction and it was a sudden uh, failure without any warning signs. And the investigation showed that there were issues with the design, with the detailing, with the construction, and with the maintenance over the years. But it was an example of an older concrete building failing after many years of apparently successful use, which brings us to the theme of there may be an issue with older buildings in, in many ways, which we need to identify uh, in order to prevent further failures. And how does Cross report on those? I'm just curious. So if, if they did the study on that, then I'm assuming uh, our, our listeners can go on Cross and look up that report and learn what the lessons were learned for that. Yeah, we didn't actually do the report on Piper's Row. That, that was in the public domain, but we do refer to Piper's Row in various of our reports as an example of something which happened. We don't carry out investigations ourselves. We report on the work of others. And if something is in the public domain, such as the uh, Florida Bridge Collapse um, or Piper's Row or Grenfell Tower, 
we follow up on that, um, but we don't initiate the forensic investigations. That's, that's not our role. And to end off here, do you have any final advice for engineers? I do, and it is to look after both the public and yourselves. Um, attorneys talk about war stories, about those which are involved in failures. So there's not only the victims, but there is great misery to those who might have been involved as engineers or others. Um, so it's very important to take all precautions against being on the wrong side of a court case, be it uh, criminal or civil. Um, so it is for your benefit as an engineer to take care of your own well-being by making sure what you do is done within your limitations to the best of your ability. And keeping out of trouble in this way will help you sleep better. Excellent. And to you know, do our jobs to protect the public. <laughs> Thanks yeah, so much, yeah. Alistair. I uh, appreciate you coming back on and sharing the progress that that Cross has been doing. And uh, yeah, thanks so much for joining us again after <laughs> a lot of episodes. Definitely appreciate it. Oh, great to talk to you again, Matt, and then come back in another couple of years and we'll yeah. <laughs> pick up on the story again. <laughs> Sounds great. Thank you very much indeed. I hope you enjoyed the episode today. We'd love to hear your feedback, comments, and or questions. To leave them, please visit structuralengineeringchannel.com. There you'll find a summary of the key points discussed in today's episode, which is episode number 84, as well as links to any of the resources, websites, or books mentioned during this episode. Don't forget to subscribe to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcast. Until next time, we wish you the best in all of your structural engineering endeavors.